As you can see, our teams are standing by with their stories at three locations across China. Let me start with Sean Caleb's and Tao Yuan. They're in Ya'an City in the southwest province of Sichuan. Hello there, Sean and Tao Yuan. Great to see you both. Well, Tao Yuan knows this already, but Sean, I am from Sichuan pro province, and I sometimes introduce my hometown as the Panda Place. And I understand you guys will be talking about panda protection in just a few moments. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think it's a great way to in introduce where you're from, Ajangsha. It is well known throughout the world. That's one thing that I can absolutely tell you. We are actually in the city of Ya'an, and it's known for three things, right? Well, we got the rain, we got the fish, the pretty girls, and of course the rain. And guess which one we're dealing with right now? <laughs> but not too bad, actually. It's very green, very plush here. And what we are standing in front of in this nice, grassy, plush location, there you see them. The fuzzy friends of everybody on earth just laying back, eating what they do best uh, here in Sichuan province. And we've been uh, in here for just a couple of days now as we continue our massive drive across part of the nation. And what an amazing experience for all of us involved in this effort, showing you how new China ahead of the anniversary marking the founding of the People's Republic of China. Now, one thing we have been able to do with our three teams covering broad sections of this nation is to show just how wide, how vast, how diverse China is. China is actually one of the 17 so-called mega uh, biodiversity countries on Earth. And it's not just the topography that marks the, the difference in the various regions, but China is also home to a wealth of variety of plants and animals. China can boast having about 14% of the animal life found on Earth and about 10% of all the plant life. And if you think about it, uh, Tao Yuan, it is really amazing. Absolutely, Sean. And that's because of the sheer size of the country, but also the great range of physical characteristics. So we got the plateaus, the mountains, forests, rivers, and plains. And many of the species are endemic, meaning that those species are restricted only to China. Giant pandas, for example, an icon of Sichuan province, and certainly an icon of China for many people home and abroad. Their cuteness is simply hard to resist. We're at the Ya'an Research center right now and one of the uh, several panda protection bases in this province. In just a moment, we're going to hear from some of the keepers of these uh, adorable creatures. Some people say they got the best job on earth, but do they really? But first, a look at the history of the uh, conservation efforts in China. I traveled to some of the most remote and wildest places in China. Take a look. This now looks like a desert. To dense sheep don't have enough grass to eat, so his family has to move more often for better grasslands. But the area used to be a different landscape. When I was little, the grass was so much better. When we rode on a horse, it used to reach up to our feet. Now the desertification is terrible. The Qinghai Tibet Plateau is dubbed Asia's water tower. This is where the continent's great rivers come from and where many consider to be one of the world's last remaining pure lands. Now the grasslands are disappearing, the glaciers melting, the roof of the world is turning into a scene of a climate change catastrophe. So Tadem became a conservationist and started protecting his homeland. The Yangtze River source region is a breeding ground for the bar-headed geese. Setting up a satellite-equipped watch station in a zone uninhabited by people, Tadem's team represents a shift in China's conservation strategy. Leading the effort is Yang Xin. In the 1980s, he built China's first non-government protection station. A humble start, which drew world attention to the reckless poaching of Tibetan antelopes. The government realized it had limited resources and manpower to carry out protection work, and they were enlisting the help of grassroots organizations. The benefit of that is we know our area. We can dedicate all of our efforts to a relatively small region. Now, NGOs like Yang Screen River are playing bigger roles in China's conservation efforts. Chu Wenwen is from Altai, China's northwestern front in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. This is China's only habitat for beavers. 
Now there are only about 500 of them left in the whole country. The habitat can only shelter so many beavers, just like when a home can only shelter three people. It'd be difficult for a fourth one to live here. The only way out is to buy more food, more beds, or to expand the home to accommodate more people. She got her love for nature from her father, a local forestry official. Back in my dad's days, wildlife production was much more of a government effort. Now China's wildlife production law wants more civilians to participate. So now we can enlist the help of more non-government entities and people to join in the effort together. People like Tali Hati. He's now helping Wen Wen take care of a beaver trapped in an irrigation canal. If we didn't take action, such as feeding it carrots or tree branches, if we didn't build this fence, it might have died already of hunger or of extreme cold, or at the hands of a predator. Back on the plateau, the newly hatched bar-headed goslings are taking their first dip. A scene that makes all the hard work worthwhile. Taoyuan, CGTN, on the Qinghai Tibet Plateau. Once again, we are in a city called Ya'an. We're at the panda base right here. And Ya'an is actually known as the hometown of pandas because about 150 years ago, a French missionary discovered a panda here and just pushed it to international stardom. Little wonder, though. Just look behind us. There's, there's, there's three on the, on the hillside <laughs> laying back. Kind of like uh, with three bamboo stooges. just sitting on their bellies. <laughs> But once again, joining us for some analysis are Victor Gao and Mr. Chen Jia. Thank you. So, Mr. Chen, let me start with you. China actually stopped giving giant pandas to uh, other countries in 1982. Instead, they started a lending program. Uh, what do you think the impact um, that project has on the protection of giant pandas? That actually uh, brought a lot of funding to this protection. Uh, it's for a long history that China gives friendly countries mm. as a good gesture, the pandas. On, on the recorded history, uh, 14, uh, 1400 years ago in the Tang Dynasty, mm. uh, China's Emperor uh, Wu Zetian has actually uh, given like two living pandas mm. and 70 panda skins to Japan as a gesture of friendly. So that's been thousands of years of history of giving this. But later on in 1978, uh, China started the market reform of the economy. And as at that time as well, uh, we have saw the pandas number of them has decreased quite a lot. So in order to preserve them, China started doing this, the, the lending of pandas, which earned China a lot of funding that can help them, which you can see that numbers is starting to grow right now. Mm, mm. Absolutely. And as I lived in uh, two of the cities where pandas have been loaned, one Atlanta and Washington, D.C., so I can say a big thank you on behalf of <laughs> all the people living there. And uh, Victor Gao, you have been really been playing the role of tourist today. You have had that phone and camera out all day. <laughs> Now, it's important, obviously, to preserve uh, biodiversity and animals endangered, such as the panda. But to do that, you really have to protect the environment. Absolutely. Nothing is more adorable than the pandas behind us. And I think uh, uh, protection of panda is not only for Sichuan or for China, but for mankind. And it takes a lot of funding, actually, to do a good job in preserving panda. And also the whole ecosystem, because panda feeds on bamboos, and bamboo live in the forest and the forest cannot survive or thrive without a good overall environment. So everything is connected. So protecting panda is not just the protection of panda itself, but the general environment at all. And I think we all need to pitch in to do a good job in terms of environmental protection. Mm, absolutely. Everyone plays a role, right, Sean? And who doesn't love pandas? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody loves pandas. Okay. Uh. Thank you very much, gentlemen, Thank as you. always. Now, Thank these you. creatures are really so adorable uh, that many foreign tourists come to Sichuan province, and they often just don't leave. They want to stay here and work in this environment. And one such person is Abe Nabuko. She is from Japan. She came here many years ago uh, to work with pandas, and she, this is her story. When I was three years old, my grandmother gave me a stuffed panda doll. I like it so much that I wouldn't go anywhere without it. When I was in high school, my mom said to me, you like pandas so much, why don't you find a job which has something to do with pandas? I thought it was a great idea. That's when I decided I want to be a panda keeper. Back then I thought pandas are in China, so I must learn Chinese well. 
So I studied Chinese in college in Japan. After graduation, I came to China's Yan'an city in Sichuan province to study animal protection. Three years later, I started working at the panda base. It's tough work to be a panda keeper. It takes a lot of physical strength. Also, you have to pull the pandas before yourself. For example, maybe you have got plans for today, but if the pandas are not feeling well, then you have to cancel your plan and take care of them. But I like the creature, and watching them eat, knowing them are healthy, all the fatigue goes away. The panda keepers here all love them. If you don't, you can't do this job. You will give up. Five seconds. <laughs> okay, we got another panda keeper here with us right now. She's from the Ya'an base. Her name is uh, Su Lingxiao. Welcome to the show, Miss Su. Uh, first of all, can you tell us what you do every day? Every day, firstly, we will have to observe and monitor the situation of the giant pandas to uh, avoid any abnormalities. And also, we would observe the cages of the giant panda to guarantee their comfortable living conditions. And for the four giant pandas we observe, we will guarantee they have enough food right. so and good relationship. Panda lovers are so jealous of your job. They think it's the <laughs> best job in the whole world. But we heard from the story just now, it, it's actually pretty tough. What's your take on that? I totally agree, because for the keepers of giant pandas, it's not an easy job. We have a lot of workload, including physical work every day. For example, for this cage, every day we will have to afford 75 kilograms of bamboos and 35 kilograms of bamboo shoots. That takes a lot of work from the keepers physically. And also, for the four, my four baby pandas, they are very familiar with my voice and my scent, so they would run to me whenever they smell of me. So we are very satisfied. So even though this is a very tiresome job, I'm very happy with it. Personally speaking, I prefer raising pandas because I love animals and I want to dedicate myself to protecting animals. And giant panda is a very rare species for the animal protection job. So protecting giant panda, that's one good way to protect the wildlife. We want to utilize the cuteness of the giant pandas to raise the awareness of giant panda protection for the public and raise their awareness of uh, the wildlife. Then we can truly contribute to the ecosystem. So tough job, but also very meaningful. Thank you for joining us, Ms. Su. And thank you for the job you do, because if you <laughs> mention giant pandas, people instantly think of China, so you know that there's a lot of pressure to make sure they're healthy mm. and happy. Okay, I know that our colleagues have got to be jealous about what we're seeing, <laughs> these big furry things laying on their fat backs, eating as much as they can. Now we're going to head over to our colleagues, Yang Chengxi and, of course, Lindy. Firstly, Yang Chengxi, welcome. Welcome to the group. They are now traveling through the southeast. Guys, how are things going uh, over in your area? Oh, thank you so much, Sean and Taiwan. You are right, we are very jealous indeed. But we're also talking about biological diversity here in the southeast. And before we get to it, yes, indeed, a warm welcome to my new co-host, Jason Zhangxi, who joins us today as we make our way to Wanzhou. Now, you guys were having too much fun. Now, I have to join. Now, <laughs> our CGTN bus has left Fujian province and is now heading north towards Zhejiang province. More specifically, we are bound for the city of Wenzhou, which is a manufacturing powerhouse. Well, it's not about pandas this side, but we are talking biological diversity. China has witnessed substantial economic growth over the past few decades, but it has come at a great cost. Widespread and in some areas severe environmental pollution has forced the country to now take action and protect China's important ecological systems. That's right, Lindy. And one example is the China Ecological Conservation Red Line, or ECRL, which was set in 2011. It is an ambitious plan to protect more than one quarter of the Chinese mainland. Measures include planting trees, monitoring emissions by factories, and designating conservation areas. And China is not taking this lightly. In some cases, entire agro farms are slated to cease operation in order to protect China's biodiversity. 
Now for more, we're joined by our guests on the bus. Now, uh, uh, it, there is Ms. Uh, Professor John Gong of uh, the University of International Business and Economics, and we also have Professor Lin Baoqiang from Xiamen University. Let me start with you, Professor Gong. Uh, the ECRL covers an area of 15 provinces. It's such a massive plan, so implementation, I guess, would be a big challenge, considering the pos uh, possible pushbacks from rural and local areas from uh, people who have to move or factories that have to shut down, isn't it? Well, of course, uh, there will be people affected and business interests will probably be damaged because of that. But we have to keep in mind that this is something we have to do. You know, especially this area is a fairly industrialized area. You know, we have manufacturing here going back a couple of decades ago. So, you know, for these people at a time when, when China was still a poor country and we started to develop and start to introduce those uh, manufacturing here, we've never thought about the ecological impact of this. But now uh, we have developed this stage, at this stage of going back and we, we have to do uh, to remedize the, 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 the damage we have caused and, 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 and the, uh, the think about these issues, implement these new policies. So I think uh, it all boils down to the government's determination. You know, we know that's going to be some uh, impact on the area's GDP. Factories have to move, people have to be relocated. It's a lot of inconvenience, uh, interests are being hurt. But you know, we well, have to do something about this. So the government has to come up with not just only determination, but also fiscal means and measures how to compensate people, business people, make them uh, whole as a result of uh, uh, moving the operations from this region. So uh, you know, this is something the government has to do. I mean, there's still quite a lot of work that needs to be done in repairing the damage caused by human activities, by development uh, in China. Professor Lin, my question is to you, what successes has China seen so far in trying to turn all of this around? I think that uh, in the environmental economics, we have one theory that says that environmental goes the curve. Mm -hmm. It says that uh, in the early development states, people only pay attention to the income as right. well as poverty alleviation. So the environmental is at the cost. And once it reaches a certain income level, then big people begin to care about environment and begin to uh, deal with the uh, environment. Now, the China is an outstanding example of the curve. Uh, in the enormous uh, economic development, we pay a huge co cost on the environmental side, uh, systematic damage on the air pollution as well as the ecological system. Uh, since a few years ago, uh, China began to uh, pay huge attention on the on the environmental issues because it is consensus among the government and general society that China's development, way of development is not sustainable. The second is that it's income level comfortable to support the, the environmental uh, uh, alleviation. Okay? Uh, so uh, the, the, the two allow, you can, you can see obviously uh, China begin to allocate the major factories, steel cement factory out of the city, move to the more remote area. Uh, we, we talked about earlier that the countryside, those people need to be factory, need to be closer. That really is not a big problem. Big problem is major factories in the, in the cities need to be removed to avoid uh, reduced air pollution. Now, the, in fact, the first red line in China is not environment. It's uh, what, what we call the 1.8 million move of Chinese farmland to ensure that Chinese people have enough food to eat. Okay? Now, the, Ecological red line is the second red line. In addition to that, we have an energy action plan. As we all know, that the most of the environment got to produce and got to do with energy also fuel consumption. So put all this together, that, that you can see the, the, the pollution in Beijing is certainly much better compared to before. And in certain areas, let me use one second to uh, give you an example. The, there's a big lake in the Kunming that called the Dianzi. When I was a banker, we tried to deal with the uh, to clean out the dents who were there. And when they said water, there's really oil, not water. And we wow. gave up because it's too difficult and costs enormous. And last year, guess what? I visited the dents. It's water now. <laughs> so uh, the, the, the achievement is tremendous. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Will is there too. Thank you very much for your insights, professors. Uh, now, the ECRL is surely an ambitious project as it covers an area almost the size of France, Spain, Turkey, Germany, and Italy combined. Uh, while protecting biodiversity on such scale is no easy feat, uh, the Chinese government is determined to go green. Now back to you, Sean and Taoyuan, and yes, we are jealous, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Uh, hi guys, just look at our just couple of our little friends back there. They're taking a rather long lunch break, aren't they? Just They're like on stage, lying, performing for us. I know. Just lying on their fat backs and <laughs> so oh. adorable. But um, let's go now to our friends in the northeast. Erica Pitsy and Susan Chen are standing by. Susan Chen, first of all, welcome to the group. And what do you have for us today? I just want to say that I am also very jealous of your assignment today. <laughs> I desperately want to see a panda in real life course, beyond the yeah. zoo. All right. Uh, yes, here we are back on the bus. We are now en route to Yanbian in northeastern China's Jilin province. And I am joined by my new co-host, Susan Chen. So welcome. Happy to be here, especially for this leg of the trip as we head to Yanbian, which borders the Korean Peninsula. Yes. It's going to be great food and great culture, right? I know, I can't wait for lunch. <laughs> it's because the Korean minority really makes up more than one third of the city's population, and we are going to have much more on how Korean culture has influenced this area. But cultural diversity aside, today we are talking about something else, right? Yes, biodiversity, which <laughs> means Northeast China is also home to many different animals, and some are incredibly precious like snow leopards and the largest tiger species on this planet, the Siberian tigers. Yeah, not to mention, we passed through the Jialong National Nature Reserve in Heilongjiang province just a few days ago, and that place is teeming with all different kinds of rare birds. Take a look. Autumn is in the air, and nature is showing off its beauty. Jialo wetland, located near the city of Qixihar, has contributed to biodiversity, clean water, and provided a habitat for hundreds of animals and plants. Covering an area of 2,100 square kilometers, this marshland is a major migratory route for birds from the Arctic to Southeast Asia. The reserve serves as a stopover and nesting area for a large number of storks, swans, herons, grebes, and other species. Its ponds and reeds make it an ideal home for over 300 different species of birds, including six kinds of cranes, especially red-crowned cranes. In April and May of each year, the white and red-crowned cranes rest here, then proceed with their journey up north. The reserve was under preparation as early as 1976. In a 1979, the Jialong Provincial Natural Reserve was established by the approval of Heilongjiang Provincial Government. In 1987, it was approved as a National Natural Reserve. Five years later, when China signed the Convention on Wetlands of International Importance mainly as a waterfall habitat, the Jialong National Natural Reserve was added to the list of international important wetlands. To out CGTN. I'm a big bird person. I think they're yeah. beautiful, and those birds are incredible. But let's go back to the big cats. Yes, the Siberian <laughs> tigers, known as Dongbeihu, which means the tiger from the northeast. And sadly, it faces the threat of extinction. But some live well in captivity here. And our reporter, Hu Chao, has more.
I mean, the Tigers can be killed too, right? So to talk more about the bigger picture on bio, Diversity protection. Let's bring our guest Tong Jimong, our current affairs commentator. So, Mr. Chow, why is it so important to preserve these lovely wildlife? Well, China actually is suffering extreme biodiversity losses over the past, let's say, four decades, because of this very intense human activities、uh, due to this very economic booming. And so, tigers, my favorite animal, actually has been the number which has been reducing、uh, because of this very intense human activities、uh, due to this once again due to this very economic booming in this part of the country. So, tigers are now a key part of our concern. I mean, in fact, my one of my friends. Is making a film about this Manchurian tiger. I mean, meant to protect this very rare、uh, animal. And so, basically, the general situation is that China is suffering and suffering this biodiversity loss. And we are trying to mend that very situation. In our 13 years five plan, we, the Chinese government, has put huge investment and also efforts in terms of protecting the rare animal, and especially some of these great animals, the Siberian bear and. Tiger, the birds that you mentioned that we see in the film.、Uh, of course, we still have a long way to go. I mean,、uh, even now when we go to the south, we look to the south. The panda、uh, population is also reducing, and so China has a huge kind of a daunting task ahead of us in order to address this very situation,、um, both in terms of protecting the land, the forestry, and also the plants that we see、uh, right now.、Uh, especially, I think that.、Um, Uh, land degradation is important because land, the soil supports these trees. For example, the perch that we saw along our way, and also the forest, the primary forest in which the, these tigers are living. Right, the animal environment. Yeah. Animal environment. Yes, absolutely. And also education, probably playing a big、yeah. role in all of this as well, alongside the government efforts. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Tong Ji Meng. And that does it from our end. Back to Sean and Taiyuan in the southwest with the pandas. Erica, Sinchen, I admit the tigers are cute, but guess what? Sean and I will get to hold baby pandas for photos after this show. Right? N- no, we're not. I'm just saying, saying it to make them jealous. Oh, that's just cruel. <laughs> that's just cruel. <laughs> but still, I mean, <laughs> I hope we didn't scare、I、the pandas. I think that was punctuating the joke right there, just to make sure you got it. <laughs> it got our attention. But still, it's good being here, seeing these.、Yeah. Um, Young pandas in their natural environment, and everything is, people have talked about throughout the day, how important it is to preserve the animals, but also the environment. I mean,、mm-hmm. just look at these warm, fuzzy creatures. I said it before; I'll say it again. Who doesn't love a panda? Everybody, Everybody. loves pandas. Okay, we're going to throw it back to Beijing.、Uh, <laughs> thanks for indulging us out here,、uh, guys. We really enjoyed our time looking at the pandas. Chong Shen, back to you. Tell you and Sean, you got to give credit to those bears behind you. Total TV star material, unfazed and uninterrupted. By our live broadcast at the bays, Taoyuan and Sean, thanks so much, and also special thanks go to my colleagues, my very jealous and hungry-looking colleagues on the routes in China's southeast and northeast regions. And tomorrow at 0400 GMT, 12 noon Beijing time, join us again as our reporters for New China tell us about the development of Chinese film. Now let's take a short break, and when we come back, we have a quick recap. Of where the journey took our new China teams yesterday.